The Biorisk Association of the Philippines together with the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists warmly welcomes everyone to this joint webinar. Let us all welcome our session moderator for this webinar. She is the incumbent treasurer of the Biorisk Association of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Luella Bertuccio, RMT. Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to our 8th BRAP webinar. I am Luella Bertuccio, the moderator for this session. To start our program, let us hear the welcome message from our BRA president, Dr. Miguel Martin Moreno. Magandang gabi po to all our viewers in the Philippines and hello to all our viewers around the globe. Tonight's activity, our eighth in the BRA PAMET Joint Webinar 2020 series, features for the second time our colleague and mentor from Sandia National Labor Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She will be properly introduced later. This essential topic entitled SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 decontamination and waste disposal is very timely during this time of pandemic. And if I may say so, a must, a must need to know knowledge. I would like to welcome all BRAP and PAMET uh, members who are with us tonight. I take this opportunity also to welcome the founding president of the Philippine Association for Central Sterilization Services and Management, also known as PACSISM, Ms. Melly Ann Alcantara, accompanied by two officers, Ms. Lolita Culaba and Ms. Uh, Arnefelina Tamayo. I hope this event brings the start of a fruitful collaboration with our two associations. Last but not the least, welcome to the fast rising viewers on our two sites on Facebook, on the BRAP Facebook group page and on the PAMET CPT, CPD activities page. On behalf of BRAP and our official partner PAMET, I wish you all a fruitful webinar and as the saying goes, break a leg everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Your welcome message inspires us to listen to beer up webinars and future and upcoming session. And now, to give the opening remarks, let us welcome the president of PAMET, Mr. Ronaldo E. Puno. Mr. Puno. Thank you very much, Ma'am Luella. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to all our uh, beer up and PAMET members and the uh, Welcome to the eighth uh, joint webinar of BRAP and PAMET. So as we continue to fight COVID-19, BRAP and PAMET uh, remains to be committed in providing continuing educational opportunities to our colleagues, particularly uh, our medical technologies, uh, like this webinar on decontamination and waste disposal. Uh, we all know that the basic knowledge of decontamination and waste disposal is crucial for biosafety in the laboratory, especially in time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I am personally very interested in these two topics that because uh, these are part of the sections that I handled in preparing the BRAP PAMET Biosafety Guidance Manual. And I am particularly thankful to our invited speaker, Dr. Cecilia Williams, who is joining us as webinar speaker for the second time to discuss these two equally relevant topics. The purpose of decontamination is to, of course, to uh, prevent uh, the spread of microorganisms and other noxious contaminants that may threaten the health of human beings or animals or even damage the environment. And with the several decontaminant methods available, physical cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization are the most commonly used during COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, proper waste management similarly plays a very, very vital role in this time of COVID-19 pandemic, which will also be given emphasis in this seminar. So we hope that through this webinar, we will be able to learn more, more, uh, more important, useful and effective strategies on the way we decontaminate and handle our laboratory waste. So once again, good evening and hope uh, everybody will learn and uh, you enjoy the session tonight. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Furno, for that heartwarming and encouraging opening remarks. Uh, before we go to our lecture, may I remind all to mute your microphone to avoid unnecessary noise and close the video for clearer resolution. If at any time during the lecture, you need to ask a question or you need to clarify something, you may put your question in the chat box and in the link provider. And last, there will be a question and answer portion at the end of the talk. So no question, no certificate. I'm just kidding. Bigyan ko lang kayo ng kwan. But be ready for the question. Moving on, let us proceed to the woman of the hour. Let me introduce our speaker for this session. Our speaker is a very good friend of our association and is well known here in the Philippines in biosafety and biosafety group. She is one of our favorite lecturers and I know she enjoys being with us. She is a principal member of the technical staff in the Global Chemical and Biological Security or the GCBS group at Sandia National Laboratories. Over her 38 year career of Sandia, she has worked as a principal investigator and a diverse technical portfolio. Currently, she leads the group's virus engagements initiatives in the Philippines, as well as the virus and chemical security initiatives in India. She has master's of science degrees in organic chemistry and igneous geology from the University of New Mexico. She earned her PhD from Texas A&M University, researching the interaction of a rotavirus non-structural protein enterotoxin with cellular cabiogelin. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all hear from Dr. Cecilia V. Williams. Okay, I, um, I'm going to share my screen now. Let me find my... Uh, so we are all working to get through this pandemic and uh, we have many challenges in our workplace as well as in our homes. Uh, this evening, we're gonna talk about decontamination as well as waste disposal. So uh, let's start with decontamination. First, I want to remind you that it's very important to perform uh, a continuous risk assessment. And what we are providing you today is provided to inform individual and organizational risk assessment and risk-based biosafety and biosecurity decisions. We have attempted to provide you with the most current information we have at the time. However, please remember that what we know and don't know is constantly changing. So you should daily take a look at uh, what is known and what is not known and use that information in order to decide how you work safely and securely. We as organizations and individuals should be willing to change procedures based upon new information. Let me caution you though, that there is a lot of misinformation circulating. So when you're looking at new information uh, uh, to inform your risk assessment, please consider the source of the information. Also remember that biosecurity is also important, but biosafety is paramount. So with this module, our objectives are to have you know the processes that are known or anticipated to be effective in removing or reducing infectious SARS-CoV-2 from surfaces and hands. We want you to feel confident that the information you are receiving is current, relevant, and has been reviewed by trusted subject matter experts. We also want you to be able to use this information we provide 
to inform your local decisions on bio-risk management when working with or encountering SARS-CoV-2 in the laboratory or even in uh, our homes and environments. This next slide focuses on the hazard profile of SARS-CoV-2, and I'm sure you all know most of the known character characteristics. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19. Uh, it is an envelope virus of 500 to 200 nanometers, uh, five, I'm sorry, 50 to, to 200 nanometers in diameter. Its primary route of infection is a mucous membrane exposure uh, to infectious droplets from infected persons or even contaminated surfaces. We also know that it can be stable up to three days on plastic and stainless steel and much less sta uh, stable on, carbo on copper and cardboard. Since it is an envelope virus, it is effectively inactivated by soap and disinfectants. We also know that humans are, are highly susceptible and there is currently no treatment. However, there are many pre treatments being evaluated and also there are many vaccines being evaluated and are going through testing. On the, the right-hand side, uh, we have a list of characteristics that are still under investigation. There is still question as to whether there is asymptomatic transmission. Uh, they are still looking into the role of aerosols and small droplets. I've seen some reports that say uh, there is transmission via aerosols, and then there's other reports that said, no, there isn't. So this is still under question. We still don't know the infective dose, and we don't know the length of infectious viral shedding. And we don't have a good understanding of immunity after infection. So this slide just gives us some information on SARS-CoV-2 stability in, on environmental surfaces and, and laboratory samples. On the right-hand side, we have data from the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet. Uh, they indicate that SARS-CoV-2 can be stable on plastics somewhere between three and seven days. On stainless steel, similarly, three and seven days. However, on cardboard, uh, less than four, I mean, on copper, less than four hours. On cardboard, less than 24 hours. And then paper, uh, less than three hours on water cloth, uh, maybe about two days on glass, up to four days. So this virus has very a varying stability depending upon the surfaces. On the right hand side, we have the viral stability in different laboratory samples like feces and urine, one to two days, diarrhea. Uh, up to four days. In cell culture, depending upon the temperature, it can be stable up to 21 days uh, at minus 80 degrees or uh, about five minutes at 70 degrees C. On the bottom part here, we have the viral load in clinical samples, and it varies from uh, about eight times 10 to the four to seven and a half times 10 to the five, depending the, the type of sample. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do before we actually get into discussing decontamination methods is run through some terminology to make sure that we're all on the same page. First of all, as Ronnie said, uh, decontamination is a general term that refers to the process of making an item safe to handle. For microbial contamination, this means reducing the contamination to where the risk of transmission is minimized or even eliminated. Some of the processes that fall under decontamination include sterilization, disinfection, and cleaning methods. Let's talk first about sterilization. Sterilization renders an item 
completely free of living microorganisms, viruses, even spores. This means if somebody is, if something is sterilized, there is no living organism on it. So something is either sterile or it's not sterile. There's no in between. Sterilization is very important for things like uh, medical instrumentation, uh, working with laboratory media, and uh, it's also important in uh, decontamination for waste disposal. So let's now talk about disinfection. Disinfection refers to a less rigorous process than sterilization. And it's a process that kills most microbes on surfaces. And we refer to terms like high, medium, and low, depending upon the type and amount of microbes that are killed. We say something has a high disinfection capability when it kills vegetative microbes and inactivates viruses, but not spores. We say it's medium when it kills vegetative microbes and inactivates most viruses. And then uh, it's low when it kills most vegetative micro, uh, microorganisms except and tuberculosis and inactivates some viruses. And typically we call these sanitizers. So now we're going to talk about types of microbial decontamination. As you can see from this slide, there are several types that range from chemical, chemical, thermal, irradiation, temporal, and mechanical. And so I'm gonna start with mechanical. And under mechanical, we have cleaning and cleaning with soap and water. Uh, this is a mechanical process. And using the soap is a very important part because there are surfactants in your soap. And so the surfactants and the friction of rubbing will help lift the particles off your surfaces or off your hands. And the water then washes away the particles. So it's a combination of the mechanical process of rubbing and the use of the surfactant that helps remove the microorganism. The second in this list is filtration. And filtration is also a mechanical process that separates particles based on different sizes. I'm sure we've all heard of HEPA filters. HEPA filters uh, relies on the different sizes of the different properties to trap particles. And a HEPA filter will uh, trap part particles greater or less than 0.3 microns at a 99% efficiency. Microns, uh, particles, the size of 0.3 microns in size, most likely pass through the HEPA filter. We also use filtration uh, in using uh, uh, cell culture media when we have to sterilize our cell culture media. The second one in our list is temporal. Temporal is simply time. Oftentimes, um, if we just leave an area that's been contaminated, if we leave it alone and wait, we know that the microbes are not stable indefinitely. And so if we leave the surfaces or the item undisturbed over a period of time, uh, the surface or item will become safe to use. And this is especially true if we know the time frame of the expected loss of, of viability on a particular surface. However, using time is not really viable if surfaces are constantly used or if a piece of equipment is constantly used and we are continually touching it. So uh, temporal might be used, for example, if you have an expensive piece of equipment that you can't use soap and water or, uh, or some kind of chemical dis uh, 
disinfectant to clean it. You might cover it and leave it for a period of time and wait for inactivation to occur. Then we have uh, chemical decontamination. And there, this is one method that most of us are familiar with. And you can see that there are many classes of uh, liquid chemical decontaminants ranging from alcohols, aldehydes, phenols, chlorines, acids, quaternary ammonium. And most of us are familiar with alcohols and chlorine. We also, on the chemical side, we have uh, gas and vapors, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, and formaldehyde. And these, uh, these chemical decontamination me uh, methods uh, have varying effectiveness on different types of microorganisms. The next uh, decontamination method we have is thermal. And I'm sure you're all familiar with thermal. Uh, all of us are familiar with autoclaves where we use a combination of steam and pressure uh, to sterilize and we use this to sterilize medical equipment and some, uh, some media. And of course, we use the autoclave to decontaminate or sterilize our laboratory waste. We can also use steam, dry heat, and boiling water to decontaminate. So we can often put an item in a dry oven to decontaminate it. And the last... Uh, area is irradiation. And some uh, we may be familiar with uh, some radiation, especially in biosafety cabinets where we have UV light to decontaminate the surfaces. There are other technologies that use microwaves and gamma rays. Uh, for example, microwaves are often used to treat shredded or infectious waste. So there are a number of ways that we can decontaminate. And let me emphasize uh, mechanical, cleaning with soap and water is very important when decontaminating yourself and your hands. This is the one best way to protect yourself. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And then most of us use chemical or thermal methods to decontaminate. Let's talk a little bit about factors that influence the decontamination of microbes. So microbes have a varying susceptibility to decontamination. Some microbes are, are least susceptible. For example, bacterial spores are, are very hardy and they're not, uh, as susceptible as in any of these other microorganisms as we go down the list to coccidia, mycobacterium, non-envelope viruses, fungi. And at this very bottom, we see enveloped viruses. And uh, they are the most susceptible, which fortunately for us, SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus. So it is very susceptible. Another thing we should consider when we're talking about the microorganism besides type is the concentration. If you have a high microbial load, then it will take longer to effectively decontaminate. The next thing that influences decontamination is the method. So it's important to consider contact time because you may need a longer contact time if you have a higher microbial load. Also, you have to consider that some methods of decontaminating may not allow for the contact time that's required. For example, isopropyl alcohol um, is a volatile chemical. And it may be that the contact time required for, uh, for a high level of disinfection 
maybe longer than the, uh, the alcohol will stay around. And so you have to be sure that uh, you have an application method that will allow for sufficient contact time. So your application method may be spraying or wiping or soaking, or if you're using vapor or gas. So contact time uh, is very important. Contact time along with the back, uh, microbial load and method of uh, application as well as the rate of application are to be considered. And the final thing you should consider is the age and storage of your chemical disinfectant. Uh, as the chemical disinfectant uh, is stored, it may become less effective. For example, uh, bleach becomes less effective as it's uh, as it sits around in your laboratory. So you should remake your bleach solutions often. The next uh, thing, a factor that influences decontamination is the environment. And that's, we need to look at the types of surfaces. Are the surfaces flat or uneven, or are they porous? So if something is as, as flat and Non-porous, it's easy, easier to decontaminate. If something is porous, it's very difficult to decontaminate. And think about trying to uh, decontaminate in a biosafety cabinet and where you have corners and edges. Uh, oftentimes those are harder to decontaminate than just a simple sur uh, surface. The other thing you need to uh, consider is the presence of other things on your surfaces, such as organic material or grease, uh, oils or biofilms. Uh, these all may have the effect of inactivating or impeding uh, the effectiveness of your decontamination chemical. Also to uh, you need to take a look at um, uh, UV light decontamination. If you have, if you're decontaminating your biosafety cabinet and there's dust on the surface, the UV light may not be able to reach the surface, as well as the UV light it doesn't may not necessarily go around the corners or get all the edges. Another thing you need to consider is temperature and relative humidity. Both of these affect the, st the stability of the microbe and the decontaminant. pH is also another thing you should consider. The pH of the hardness of the water you use to dilute your chemical uh, disinfectant could impact its effectiveness. And it's imperative that you prepare your surfaces properly for decontamination and you prepare your chemical disinfectants by the manufacturer's specifications so you can duplicate the effectiveness that the manufacturer associates with their product. So uh, now we're going to talk about um, SARS-CoV-2 after uh, exposure to decontamination methods. So uh, it's been found that SARS-CoV-2 is undetectable uh, in less than or equal to five minutes when using hand soap. Over here, when we take a look at the chemical disinfectants, SARS-CoV-2 is undetectable in less than five minutes using uh, household bleach, iodine, chlorozylenol, chlorohexadiene, all of these in less than five minutes is undetectable. Sorry about that. Remember, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus, and so it is easily to destroy the envelope. And when you destroy the envelope, you effectively uh, inactivate the virus. 
We do know, however, that SARS-CoV-2 can be stable on some surfaces for more than 60 minutes across a wide range of pH and at room temperature. Using thermal methods, we know that uh, at four degrees, uh, it's undetectable in about 14 days, 22 degrees, uh, around seven days, 37 degrees, two days, 56 degrees, 30 minutes, and 70 degrees, around five minutes. And so using uh, even like thermal dry heat to decontaminate, putting items in a drying oven that's at least 70 degrees for more than five minutes will effectively decontaminate for SARS-CoV-2. So um, let's take a look at surfaces and decontaminating equipment. So when decontaminating surfaces, it's imperative that you use disinfectants that have proven activity against envelope viruses. And you can go to the web and look up uh, US EPA and there's a list called the analyst that'll give you a list of disinfectants uh, and their activity against different microorganisms. For SARS-CoV-2, we can use bleach or sodium hypochlorite, a thousand parts per million. We can use ethanol, 62 to 71% ethanol, hydrogen peroxide, 5%, and quaternary ammonium compounds. Again, you should pay attention not only to the selection of your disinfectant, but also the contact time and the dilution and the expiration date of your working solution. Remember that things like your bleach solution degrade quickly over time. Let's talk about equipment. Disinfection of equipment should be done in the manner that the manufacturer recommends in order to have continued uh, functioning and integrity of the material in the equipment. You may be use some of the same disinfectants that you use on laboratory surfaces, depending upon the recommendation of the manufacturer. Also, you may be able to use thermal decontamination, uh, such as dry heat or even a autoclave or boiling, depending upon the piece of equipment. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if a piece of equipment is not amenable to decontaminating with heat, or with a chemical disinfectant, you can use time. You can cover the piece of equipment and put a sign that it's out of service and uh, wait for a period of time for decontamination. As uh, I'm gonna back up a slide. As you recall that uh, at uh, in between 22 degrees and uh, 37 degrees, you can leave a piece of equipment uh, up to between two and seven days, and it will uh, essentially become safe to use after that period of time. So the last thing I wanna talk about is hand washing. For personal safety, hand washing is one of the most important things that we can do. Laboratory personnel need to wash their hands after removing their gloves when they've been working with infectious agents and before leaving the laboratory. Understanding that the stability of a SARS-CoV-2 varies on different surfaces, if surfaces haven't decon been decontaminated and you cannot tell by looking, it's very important that if you've touched a surface, wash your hands before leaving the laboratory. That way, you, if you touch your face or your eyes or your nose, which we all do, uh, you won't contaminate yourself. So it's very important to use soap and water for uh, washing for at least 
20 seconds. And just plain soap and water is as effective as antibacterial uh, soaps. And remember, it's the mechanical process of the rubbing and the surfactant in the soap that helps lift the uh, viral particles off your hands and are washed away with the water. Oftentimes though, soap and water is not available and you can use alcohol-based sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol. So using a hand sanitizer is a chemical method of disinfection and the sanitizing agent will be effective by the same factors that influence other disinfectants. So if your hands are dirty and greasy, your hand sanitizer may not be effective on first use. You may have to use a couple of them. But uh, whenever possible, as soon as uh, hand, uh, soap and water of, uh, are available, you should wash your hands with soap and water. Here I have a list of references that have been used in putting this presentation together. And uh, I, I will make this available to Martin and Martin can uh, make this available to anyone who would like it. So now we are going to, uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, so I can get to my other presentation. Let's see. Uh, okay, there we go. So um, now we're going to go from decontamination to laboratory waste disposal. And I'm going to remind you uh, that you should do a continuous risk assessment when you are uh, preparing your laboratory waste disposal methodology, mainly because what we know about SARS-CoV-2 is changing rapidly. So for um, this module, we would like you to know the processes of collecting, disposing, and treating laboratory waste, including the processes that are known or anticipated to be effective in removing or reducing infectious uh, SARS-CoV-2 waste. We want you to feel confident that you are receiving current and relevant information and it's been reviewed by Trusted Matter SME. We also want you to be able to use this information to make your decisions on waste disposal and bio-risk management when working with or encountering the SARS-CoV-2 in your laboratory. So I'm gonna skip this slide because we've already talked about the hazard profile. Oh, I have a picture missing. The categories of biological waste include solids, sharps, pathological waste, mixed waste, and liquid waste. So solid waste includes uh, laboratory plastic ware, uh, disposable PEPE, wipes, stool samples, animal cage, and bedding. Sharps includes anything that has a point or an edge. Pathological waste includes uh, samples of human or animal organs or tissues. Of course, liquid waste are your aspirants, clinical or bodily fluids. And then mixed waste is mixed biological and chemical waste. For some reason, my, uh, my slideshow is missing some of my pictures. I apologize. So the steps of waste management include segregation, collection, storage, transport, treatment, and disposal. You should look at these steps and make sure that your laboratory waste management includes all of these steps. Remember that waste disposal from COVID-19 patients should be handled 
as a, just as other uh, biohazardous waste in your laboratory. It doesn't need any special treatment or additional packaging or disinfection procedures. And remember that the volume of infectious waste during the COVID-19 outbreak is expected to increase. So it's important that you increase your capacity for handling and treatment of healthcare waste. So let's talk about the different uh, steps in laboratory waste disposal. Segregation and collection go hand in hand. You should segregate your sharps from your um, bio, uh, from your pathological waste. You should, uh, and you should segregate it from your solid waste and your mixed waste. And so each type of waste should be segregated and put into some type of designated container or bag. It should be uh, leak resistant and, uh, and should, should contain the waste so that it is not uh, spilled or, or there's not an accident in your laboratory. For example, if you have liquid waste, you should be sure you put your liquid waste in a container that is leak proof. You should also store this medical waste in labeled leak-proof containers, uh, especially if they have foul odor. Facilities should dispose of the waste regularly and your area should be well ventilated and away from pests, the area where you store this, uh, where you store your waste. Remember, biosafety and biosecurity incidents often occur as the result of improper handling and storage or incompletement of waste. So you segregate and collect your waste. You store it in an area that is uh, safe and away from pests and non-laboratory personnel. Then the next step is treatment and final disposal. Oftentimes laboratory, uh, laboratories will conduct treatment in their facility. For example, uh, you may take your waste to a, uh, to autoclaving and autoclave it prior to, um, final disposal. So COVID waste need not be rendered sterile and the treatment processes may include autoclaving, incineration, internment, chemical disinfection, grinding methods, or other di disinfection and capsulating methods. So remember microbiological waste has the greatest potential for, in for infectious disease uh, transmission. So ideally you should consider on-site decontamination such as autoclaving incineration prior to final disposal. And of course, final disposal uh, is to remove the waste from contact from the general public. All those who handle healthcare waste, of course, should wear appropriate PPE and should perform hand hygiene upon removal of that PPE. And remember that PPE is then considered laboratory waste and, uh, and should be disposed of properly. Some other considerations we should look at is, do you encounter waste from medical emergencies? If there are waste from the medical emergencies, you should follow standard operating procedures for containment and disposal of used PPE and regulated medical waste. I, I don't know if any of you encounter uh, bodies of persons who have died from, uh, are known or suspected of dying from COVID-19 or if any of you do autopsies, but 
Uh, for autopsies, following an autopsy, you should follow standard operating procedures for containment and disposal of used PPE and regulated medical waste. Uh, you should certainly use tongs uh, to uh, dispose of this medical waste to prevent personal contact. Disposal of human tissue should be done according to routine uh, procedures for pathological waste. And of course, uh, after a body has been bagged, the outside should be disinfected and um, and wear, when you're disinfecting it, you should wear disposable gloves. Um, there is no evidence of persons having become disinfected uh, infected from exposure to bodies of persons who've died from COVID-19. Another important thing is people attending a body should ensure uh, they wear they wear appropriate PPE and hand hygiene, and a body should be wrapped for transport and direct human contact should be minimized. One thing we have to consider is the dignity of the dead and their families, which should be protected. Embalming has, is not recommended, and uh, friends and families may want to view the body. And so we should discourage any touching or kissing of the body. Uh, oftentimes this is a practice in some cultures. Thorough hand washing with soap and water should be done after viewing. And of course you should abide by all national and local regulations for viewing and disposal of remains. Other points you should consider for your waste treatment is the waste treatment options must rely on local requirements. Also, we must remember we have cradle to grave responsibility. And so that includes on-site treatment, off-site treatment, and disposal. All who handle healthcare waste should wear appropriate PPE. And remember the categories of waste need to be managed by the different types of waste. Sharps pose the greatest risk of injury. So we must take particular care in handling sharps. All facilities should have a waste management plan that complies with local requirements. Also too, when using your autoclaves or your incinerators for your sterilization or decontamination, you should ensure uh, they, are, they are used properly and that um, they are, uh, their upkeep and operation is correct to reduce um, risk to laboratory workers and to the environment. And remember to perform a risk assessment when updating your waste disposal plan. In summary, the waste from SARS-CoV-2 should be considered as other biohazardous waste in your laboratory. You need to consider the following steps in preparing your waste management plans. Segregation, collection, storage, transport, treatment, and final disposal. All healthcare workers who handle healthcare waste and bodies of confirmed or suspected COVID-19 cases should wear appropriate PPE and always perform proper ha hand hygiene after removal of your PPE. Remember you are responsible for all on-site and off-site waste treatment and disposal. And again, remember information surrounding COVID-19 is constantly changing and there is much information. 
be prepared to evaluate the new information and conduct a risk assessment as new information becomes available. Because all of our goal is to keep ourselves safe and healthy during this pandemic. And again, here are some references and resources. And I will provide this to Martin and he can share it with anyone who has requested it. And I apologize for my uh, a few technical difficulties and especially uh, my slideshow that for some reason wasn't showing my uh, figures. And with that, I will take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Cecilia, for that very informative lecture. And we are truly appreciate having you as one of our speakers here. Uh, moving on, we will now open the floor for the question and answer portion. First, I will read a question from the chat box. And those who of you who would like to ask the question yourself, please point your cursor to the raised hand and I will call your name. Okay? We have several questions here in the chat box. Um, Dr. Cecilia, the first question is from Raymer Sanapo. Can you hear me, Dr. Cecilia? Yes, I hear you. Okay. How can we or how to validate record form of waste decontamination using physical, chemical, and or biological indicator? How can we do, how can we or validate and how to validate the record form? So how to validate that you have successfully decontaminated something or a surface? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes, form of, yes. A record form of waste decontamination using the physical and chemical. Record so form. I don't understand what you're saying, uh, what you mean by record form, but you can all, yes. all you can always validate the uh, whether or not uh, you have successfully decontaminated the surface by taking a swab and, and culturing it. Or there's such a thing as a RODAC plate where you actually touch the surface and you uh, incubate it and uh, if something grows on it. And, but you're specifically looking for um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so I would... Um, swab the surfaces and use whatever method you have um, developed for identifying SARS-CoV-2. What you might want to do is it, you don't want to propagate the virus. So you might want to uh, use PCR to determine if in fact uh, SARS-CoV-2 is still present. Does that answer mm -hmm. the question? Okay, I hope. <laughs> I hope Mr. Raymer Sanapo accepted your answer. I think okay, that's what he was asking. Mm -hmm. you, you know, yes. besides SARS CoV 2, of course, there may be other microbial uh, contamination. So, swabbing the surface and um, just culturing it will, uh, will get you the other microbes. But for the virus, uh, I would. Uh, I would try PCR uh, mm -hmm. on the sample that you take. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cecilia. Second question is, what is your recommended retention period for swab samples? And how long should you store a swab sample before disposing it? First of all, uh, I suggest that you check your laboratory procedure on what the recommended retention time is for a swab. Um, I can't tell you how long you should retain it. You should have a laboratory procedure that tells you how long to retain it. For example, uh, I worked in an Ebola lab during the outbreak and we had many swab samples and we would take the swab samples and we would, uh, of course, uh, 
inactivate them and, and uh, collect the uh, the RNA yeah, DNA you, material, yeah. and we would we would run our test on the actual samples. Once we had collected what we needed, we destroyed the samples. We our guideline was not to retain the samples. So mm -hmm. the retention time that you keep your samples mm -hmm. should be uh, something designated by your facility or by, uh, by your uh, public health department or the Philippine mm -hmm. public health department. I can't tell you how long to do that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, next question. Is, is, is it possible to disinfect or decontaminate the N95 respirator? If so, what are the processes be effective, are effective? Um, N95 respirators are designed for single use. However, okay. in this current environment, uh, it is often, you don't often have a supply. There have been some um, methods that have been developed to decontaminate them. Uh, however, I, uh, I don't have those methods off the top of my head. I do have a document that I can forward to uh, Doc Martin, and he can forward it to whoever wants it. But typically... N95s, if you have a sufficient supply, they should be single use. Okay. Okay. Uh, next is, in disinfection, it is safe to use a UV, a UV light lamp for disinfection purposes at home? Do you recommend the UV light at home as disinfection? The UV uh, light? I, I personally wouldn't spend the money to buy a UV light. SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus. Envelope okay. viruses are easily decontaminated mm -hmm. with alcohol and chlorine. Alcohol mm -hmm. essentially disinfects, uh, uh, actually dries mm -hmm. out the uh, envelope. Mm -hmm. It sucks the water out of it. And mm -hmm. the chlorine essentially pokes holes in it. Uh, alcohol and chlorine are extremely effective. That's what I would use. Uh, okay. And okay. For, as I mentioned, uh, soap and water is good. Soap good. You could, okay. You could, you could also use uh, your kitchen dish soap or mm -hmm. hand soap. So there are a number of things. Uh, I mm. wouldn't spend the money to purchase. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, doctor, can you give insight about the use of spray bottles as method of applying disinfectant while working inside the biosafety cabinet? CDC strongly recommends against using it, but the WHO allows it. Can well, you give the, if the insight for this? Okay, uh, a spray bottle and... Uh, what are you spraying is, is my first question. Uh, if, you, if you have a biosafety cabinet and you have uh, and a stainless steel, if you're using alcohol, that's very harsh on, on your stainless steel. Um, what, what you have to remember, even in a biosafety cabinet, if you're spraying, the spray has the possibility of spreading the um, contaminant. So if I were spraying a surface in a biosafety cabinet, I would put down an absorbent material and spray the material. Mm -hmm. And let that set on the surfaces. On the side walls, mm -hmm. I would wipe. Uh, of course, oh. using the appropriate um, PPE, the appropriate gloves, because uh, you have to be careful when you're spraying, even though you have a sash, that some of that spray doesn't come back on you. And if there's a contaminant, uh, does the spray pick up the contaminant? Uh, and so I would, like I said, on, 
on the, uh, the walls and the sides, I would use wiping. And if you want to spray on the, on the, on the, the work surface itself, put down some absorbent material. And actually, uh, you should always put down absorbent material when you're cleaning up a spill. You should never spray directly on the spill because when you spray on the uh, when you spray on the spill, you spread it out. But if you put the absorbent material over it, you contain it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here that. Is there a study where in salt water can destroy the COVID-19? Yeah, so I have not seen any studies on salt water, water? Mm -hmm. specifically. However, if you recall, when we were talking about the stability of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, it is stable over a wide range of pH. And so... Uh, a salt water itself may not uh, decontaminate. I uh, have not seen any studies. Uh, okay, thank you. Then can a person have immunity if he had already infected with COVID virus? That is something that okay. has not been established. That is one of the things when you know, I was talking about the hazard profile, is they're still trying to determine whether a person develops immunity based upon the infection, uh, uh, a previous infection. Uh, there has been some uh, studies done on the T cells that might be involved in immunity, but there's no definitive answer at this time. Okay, next question. Uh, do you recommend Lysol disinfectants? It is, uh, can Lysol disinfectants, do you recommend for this? What I Lysol. Would, yes, Lysol, I understand yeah. Lysol. I would, I would read the manufacturer's recommendation on the uses of Lysol. Uh, I'm not sure what is in Lysol. I, I don't use Lysol, so I, I don't oh. know specifically what's in it, but I'm sure it's a disinfectant that has one of the chemical groups that we have listed. And so I, I suggest if you want to use Lysol, <laughs> go to the internet, Google Lysol, find out what the manufacturer recommends and find out what the ingredients are. And if it's one of the chemical disinfectants that are common, we know that we're dealing with an envelope virus and envelope viruses are easily decontaminated. And again, mm -hmm. I, go back, I go back to bleach and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Those are the yeah. things to use. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here, I think, uh, uh, very simple question. If it in case the virus also is stay in leather materials like shoes and bags, what is the best disinfection for that? Shoes and bags. Yeah. What kind of bags, like grocery bags <laughs> or, or, or something? The grocery bags, any, any kind of bags. Any kind of bag. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know that I have some very nice running shoes that mm -hmm. uh, if they were contaminated, I would throw them in the washing machine. However, I have some very nice leather shoes that I wouldn't want to do that with. And I may not want to uh, decontaminate them with any kind of chemical decontaminant. Uh, and I would have to consider, well, can I wash them with soap and water? Remember, we said yeah. soap mm -hmm. and water is very effective. Yeah. Uh, but alternatively, oh. if you don't want to wash the bags or you don't want to uh, uh, use any kind of chemical disinfectant, remember, time is a good method of disinfection. And we know 
that between 22 and 37 degrees, the mm -hmm. uh, SARS-CoV-2 lasts from two to five, two to seven days. So I would, oh. I would put them in an uh, area, cover them, and leave them for at least a week, and then uh, they would probably be safe to use. So soap and water. Oh. If, if they can go through soap and water, uh, uh, chemical disinfectant, if you want to use that on, uh, on your bags or your shoes or just time. So you have three options. Okay. If you didn't have uh, the contamination like the shoes, how long does the virus stay in the leather materials, like the shoes and bags, et cetera? How long the virus uh, stay? I, I haven't specifically looked at leather, but... But a cloth, as I recall, it was um, three or four days. But uh, so what you just, uh, you just put them aside. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to be really safe, I would put them aside for two weeks. And then uh, I think you would be fine. Okay. Uh, how should we disinfect facials made of plastic if it is required to be worn out outside? Okay. Face shields. Yeah. Uh, I think water is soap and water. Soap and only. water. Wash them. Yeah. And yes. wash them frequently because uh, you're wearing the face shields and you're breathing in and out. Uh, I would use, um, yeah, soap and water. I would not mm -hmm. use any kind of chemical. And, and you should, when you wear a face shield, you should wear a face shield that is multi-layered uh, mm -hmm. or... A surgical mask is fine. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, this is the last question or maybe the second to the last. Some establishments here, they use 70% isopropyl alcohol to maximize their use and supply, but it will still be effective? <laughs> no, always. You, <laughs> always. you do not use alcohol at 100%. You said, mm -hmm. <laughs> You don't use alcohol in 100% because of its vapor pressure. It evaporates very quickly. So you should always, uh, and even what I recommended earlier was 60 to 70% alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 to 70% alcohol with a sufficient contact time is best. And the reason is that with the water in the alcohol, it lowers the vapor pressure and allows the alcohol to stay on the surface longer without evaporating. Okay, uh, this is my last question, I, I think. When is it appropriate to transport or confer of confirmed SARS-CoV specimens by pneumatic, by pneumatic tube? What is the appropriate trans to transport um, confirmed SARS-CoV specimen by using pneumatic tube. Okay, so you're transporting patient specimens, say, within the hospital yeah. to yes. the laboratory by pneumatic tube. Yes. When okay. it is approved. So, uh, again, that is a decision or guidance I can't give. The mm -hmm. hospital or the mm -hmm. health department must have guidance that each facility must follow. Now, when you put a specimen in a pneumatic tube, I'm sure you just don't take the specimen and put it in a tube. You may put it in another container. Okay. Uh, tube. But I would follow the guidelines of the facility. And... Mm -hmm. Let me remind you that SARS-CoV-2 is no different than any other biohazard. And especially since it's an envelope virus, it doesn't need any special treatment. Use the procedures you have in place for handling, treating, and disposing any biological material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Cecilia. Then due to lack of time, we have to put an end to our question and answer.
uh, thank you for your participation, uh, viewers, and that was a very lively interaction. I hope that you were clarified by the answers from our very good speaker. Once again, thank you, Dr. Cecilia Williams. Yes, and I apologize for my technical difficulty. Okay, no problem. Thank you once again. Okay, moving on for a brief summary of uh, Dr. Cecilia Williams' talk. Uh, there were two presentations in her talk. The first part is about the the contamination. The objective of this first lecture were to know processes known or anticipated to be effective in removing or reducing infectious SARS-CoV-2 from surfaces, hands, and etc. Then to feel confident that information received is current and relevant and to be able to use this information provided to inform local decisions on virus management when working with or encountering SARS-CoV-2 in the laboratory. And last, proper washing, proper hand washing had been discussed as one of the best way to protect ourselves. Then, the second part of the lecture is about the laboratory waste disposal. What are the objectives? Is to know the processes for collecting, disposing, and treating laboratory waste, including processes known or anticipated to be effective in removing or reducing infectious SARS-CoV-2 waste. Third, to feel confident that the information received is current, relevant, and has been reviewed by authorities. And last, to be able to use the information provided to inform local decisions on waste disposal and virus management when working with or encountering SARS-CoV-2 in the laboratory. Once again, thank you very much. I hope everyone learned a lot from these two modules presented by our speaker tonight. Thank you very much for your attendance and very active uh, participation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again and have a good day. See you again. Marami pong salamat.